finish talking about, oh, your exams. They are graded, okay? I have three more that I have to finish grading, um, and I'll have the grades up probably late tonight. The average was a 74. The highest was a 97. The lowest was somewhere in the 50s. Okay? So, there were, anyways, that's, no, no curves. All right, all right, so let's move on. So I'll have those grades up either tonight or tomorrow morning, probably late tonight, okay? All right, so there it's done. Let's move on. We finished talking about the brain and the functional areas of the brain. Let's continue a little bit more about the brain itself. All right, the central, we'll talk about white matter in the brain. Where is white matter in the brain, superficial or deep? Deep. Where is white matter in the spinal cord, superficial or deep? Superficial, okay? So where is the white matter, deep to the gray matter? What gives white matter its color? Myelination, okay? What cells produce the myelin sheath in the central nervous system? Oligodendrocytes, okay? So myelinated axons in the brain are grouped together in what we call tracks, okay? These are important association areas, all right? So we have association tracks. They connect regions of the cerebral cortex. What does association mean? It means they're linked, right? So they're going to link things together. So we're going to associate different regions. All right, so we have arcuate fibers with the short tracks contain, connecting neighboring gyri such that you might see in the somatosense, the sensory cortex in the parietal lobe and the motor cortex in the frontal lobe. There might be some association tracks that's there, okay? And then we have longitudinal fasciculi. They're longer tracks connecting gyri in different lobes. So we're always going to connect things. Okay, and then now we have commissural tracks. Commissures connect regions in different hemispheres, all right? They go from left to right, and they're gonna connect the two things together, especially like your motor functions from left to right, all right? We have a dominant hand, a non-dominant hand, but we have to move things together. We do complicated movements like golfing, swinging a golf club, swinging a, a, a baseball bat, throwing. They're coordinated movements on your left side and your right side, and you have, to you have to associate those motor cortexes, those motor areas together, all right? Those important things include the corpus callosum, which is one large uh, white area, and it allows for connection of left and right hemispheres, and the anterior and posterior commissure that are associated with it. So here's the kind of the central white matter tracks and association. Arcuate fibers are smaller, and they connect nearby gyri, the longitudinal fasciculi connect larger pieces, right? You don't see the commissure tracks here because we're only looking at one hemisphere. Oh, well, you see one area of commissure tracks. Okay. I rescued it, kind of, kind of. So we have projection tracks. All right, they link the cerebral cortex to the inferior brain regions and the spinal cord. All right, so a little bit different. All right, they go back to front. So now these white matter tracks are going to link the brain to everything else in the, sp in the spinal cord. What do you notice about the projection, projection tracks down here? What's this happen? What does it do, Kelly? crosses over. So what happens when you want to move your right hand? What side of your body is working? Your left, right? Left. And this is where the crossover occurs. So, right, your left hemisphere is working, left motor cortex, but all of that kind of crosses over within the brain stem prior to spinal cord. Okay? Other important areas in the, the brain, right, what we call cerebral nuclei. Nuclei are deep gray matter. Where is gray matter normally, the most of it is found where? In the brain. Superficial or deep? Superficial. 
okay? But there are areas of gray matter that are deep, and what we, those are what we call basal or cerebral nuclei. So we have the caudate nucleus, the lentiform nucleus, and the amygdaloid nucleus, all right? A wall, so also part of the brain we call the amygdala, or the amygdala region. Right, the amygdala is important for functions in mood and emotions, okay? And it's uh, very much associated with the sense of smell. All right, caudate nucleus produces pattern and rhythm of walking movements. All right, and the lentiform nucleus helps control movements at the subconscious level and actually influences, influences the thalamus in some areas. All right, so here's what it looks like in some areas deeper in in the cerebrum you have areas of gray matter all right you don't really have to be able to identify them so much just know that they're there and they kind of they're important for uh, coordinated movements coordinated actions the amygdala region you should know what that is is associated with emotion I like this picture because so, it also shows you where the lateral ventricles are in relation to the third ventricle. So it covers the cerebrum, important gray, or white matter, gray matter. Let's talk about the other parts of the brain, the diencephalon, all right? The diencephalon includes areas such as the epithalamus, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus. Okay, this is the area of the brain which is deep. It's underneath the cerebrum. You can't really see it from the outside, right? And this area of the brain helps control uh, homeostasis, long-term homeostasis. It actually integrates sensory, motor, and visceral <coughs> pathways together, right? And important in your long-term maintenance of the of the body okay so it's underneath the corpus callosum here's that white matter tract that's there you have the fornix which is this area that's at the bottom of the third ventricle okay and then you have areas of importance this thing right here is the thalamus all right the area underneath the thalamus this area right there that is the hypothalamus, okay? And then the epithalamus are these two things together, the, pine the pineal gland, right? And the habner, hab habenec, no, hab I don't know. That, just put it, the important part of the epithalamus is the pineal gland, all right? That you need to know for now. <clears throat> the tectal plates are um, things that are analogous to the corpora quadrimeter that you did in the sheep dissection last week in lab, right? So you see them in between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. At the bottom, at the inferior part of the hypothalamus is this area right there. It's kind of a little funnel. That's called the infundibulum. That connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland, which is right there. And you actually notice the pituitary gland is colored in two different, two different colors. It's not that it's partly gray matter, partly white matter. It's actually part of it is the anterior pituitary is derived from uh, part of the same tissue that make up your mouth and the epithelial tissue that, di that uh, secrete hormones. <laughs> And the posterior pituitary is actually derived from the ner nervous tissue that's similar to what you had in the brain. So it's actually this kind of um, mix of tissues that is, are produced, the pituitary. The pituitary is, is what we call the master organ, and it covers, it controls a lot of your endocrine function, right? Reproductive function, homeostasis, which we'll talk about in a few weeks. All right, so the epithalamus and the habenuler, habenuler nuclei, right? Epithalamus, the pineal gland, it secretes melatonin. What's melatonin responsible for? Right, sleep patterns, right? Normal sleep, and this helps maintain your circadian rhythm, your normal daylight cycles. 
As college students, you probably are all out of whack with your, with your circadian rhythms. You stay up late, right? You sleep in late probably, right? You're all messed up. But you probably also have a normal time where you get hungry every day, right? You have a normal time where you should be getting tired every day. You probably have a normal time that you would wake up every day if you just didn't have an alarm clock or anything else like that. You didn't force yourself to stay up, right? That's why when you get to be older, people wake up before sunrise and they go to bed earlier because they, they have a normal circadian rhythm. That's why when, you get, when we have a change in time where, you're, right, where we change, turn the clocks back or put them forward, your body's thrown off a little bit right? because your normal circadian rhythm. The habanula nuclei relay signals from the limbic system to the midbrain. That is emotional responses right? involved in visceral and emotional responses to odors. Right? A smell which then leads to a visceral gut reaction something smells bad, you may have a, you know, a vomiting, emetic re reaction that occurs, right? That is the habenular nuclei. The thalamus is an oval mass of gray matter, right? On lateral sides of the third ventricle. Com it's composed of about a dozen thalamic nuclei, right? It's important, it receives signals from all conscious senses, right? Except smell. All right, it is very much an integration center. So it receives everything from all of your senses and integrates that signals and relays those signals to other things. Think of it as kind of a uh, train station, right? It's gonna send signals one way or the other. It's a diverter, it's a router, if you will, okay? Incoming signals, outgoing signals, they all kind of process through the thalamus, all right? And this is kind of what it looks like if you were to dissect it out. You don't have to know the different parts of it, but the nuclei are just kind of, they're named for where they are in, in the thalamus, and then you have an interthalamic adhesion. What do you think the interthalamic adhesion is important for? One side of the thalamus talking to the other. The hypothalamus is at the anterior inferior, antero inferior region of the diencephalon, right? Hypothalamus, hypo means under, it's the area under the thalamus, and it has the infundibulum, that little kind of stalk that attaches to the pituitary gland. I kind of, it is more of a funnel than a stalk in my opinion, because it actually funnels hormones from the hypothalamus to the pituitary. The pituitary is the master organ, okay, that controls a lot of the, endo the endocrine function of the cell of your body, but the hypothalamus actually controls um, much of the, the pituitary. So the hypothalamus, right, actually controls much of your autonomic nervous system, which we'll talk about next week, okay? Your autonomic nervous system controls your heart rate, respiration rate, right? How you react to stimuli, your rest and digest, right? All of that is controlled by your autonomic nervous system, stuff you can't control, right? But then it also controls your endocrine system. That is long-term homeostasis, reproduction, secretion of hormones, uh, functions of uh, antidiuretic hormone, how your kidney works. Oxytocin, it's emotions associated with love, um, et cetera. Okay? Lots of all of that is produced. Okay? Altogether, in terms of in terms of homeostasis, body temperature is controlled by hypothalamus, part emotional behavior, food intake, how much food you you take in when you feel full, when you don't feel full, when you want to eat, when you don't want to eat water consumption, and your sleep-wake rhythms. So everything in this case is kind of integrated into control by part of the hypothalamus as well. All right? And 
the different parts of the, of the hypothalamus we can talk about in terms of what they are and where they're, where they're do, kind of where they are. One important one is kind of suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN, which at one point biologists thought that neuroscientists actually had some data to produce that the suprachiasmatic nucleus was uh, enlarged in individuals or dip, associated with uh, sexual orientation. So they say. I have not. Uh, that and the ventral media nucleus were both associated with sexual orientation. But, like I said, I have not seen any papers, research associated with that since then. Okay? Questions? Moving on. So, the brain stem, right? Really the, now, so that's the diencephalon. Really three parts are really important for, right? The thalamus, the epithalamus, and the hypothalamus. We'll talk about the pituitary. The brain stem, there's three parts, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, okay? They control, they influence a lot of the normal functions of the body, respiration rate, uh, heart rate, they keep things going, kind of the basal structure, the baseline uh, rhythms that are present, okay? So they can, for, to, to do this, they contain autonomic nuclei, right, and the nuclei of cranial nerves, right? You'll see the number of cranial nerves that come off of the brain stem. So diencephalon is the anterior part, right? And now we have the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. And all of these, uh, let's see, I just draw arrows to them. All of these yellow things, are cranial nerves. So the predominance of cranial nerves actually come off of the brain stem. Okay? A couple of them that don't, okay, are the olfactory cranial nerve, right, which is number one. And then from there you have this is the optic, this is the optic chiasm, that's cranial nerve number two. Here's three, four, Five, this is six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I don't know, this would be eleven, twelve, something like that. Okay? I don't like this picture, but you'll see. So the cranial nerves originate from the brain. They are part of the peripheral nervous system. Okay, and there you'll go through lab, talk about uh, what they do, how to test them. Right, for lecture, you need to know the name. You don't have to identify them on a picture, but you will have to do that for lab. So name of each cranial nerve, its number, its general function, and whether it's sensory, motor, or mixed, right, its type. And the cranial nerve worksheet that I put on, uh, posted on Blackboard will list all of that for you, all right? Next is the midbrain. Uh, well, por the first anterior portion of it is the midbrain. Uh, not much in terms of uh, most function here. Um, really, connection. There are some importance, right? So you can see the oculomotor nerve comes off of the midbrain. Um, that is cranial nerve number three. What do you think it does? Oculomotor. Moves the eyes, all right? It's for, so it's a motor nerve for eye movement. All right, so the pons, all right, bulging region anterior, on the anterior brain stem, couple different important parts, right? So we have uh, the, cere the, mid, the middle cere cerebellar peduncles, right? There's connections to the cerebellum. The important part to the pon of the pons is the pontine respiratory center. All right, which helps regulate the skeletal muscles of breathing. Okay? Your diaphragm is a skeletal muscle, so it requires voluntary innervation. But you cannot physically not breathe. Right? 
You can hold your breath for as long as you want right now, voluntarily, but at some point, the impulse will be to breathe and inhale, okay? Your pons regulates that. It is a voluntary motor nerve that stimulates the diaphragm, but is an involuntary control of it, okay? Um, superior olivary nuclei helps with sound localization, so you know where I am in, in the room, right, where things are coming from. And then you have cranial nerve nuclei, nuclei for cranial nerve five, six, seven, and eight. Five is trigeminal. Trigeminal is five. Abducens six, facial seven, and vestibular cochlear nerves is eight. What does the vestibular cochlear nerve have to do with? What do you think? Yeah. Hearing, okay? Vestibulo cochlear, right? So the vestibule and the cochlear are both yeah, associated with the ear. <clears throat> okay, so here's part of the pons. Different parts of the cranial nerves that come off, and the pons is the big bump, the first big bump, medulla is the second big bump, okay? The medulla is the caudal or uh, it's a rear, lower part of the brainstem. It is continuous with the spinal cord, all right, and it has things called pyramids. Pyramids are a pair of ridges that's on the anterior surface, right, and um, important for intra the tracks of neurons that go through the spinal cord, all right. Well, we call, there's a thing called olives which are lateral bulges um, to each pyramid, and then you have inferior cerebral peduncles, right, connections, that's your connection from the medulla to the cerebellum. Important, really the important part of the medulla is the autonomic nuclei. You have autonomic nuclei of the pons and autonomic nuclei of the medulla. What nervous system uh, classification do you think is gonna control, that they're going to control? The somatosensory nervous system, the somatomotor nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system. Which one? Their autonomic nuclei. What do you think they control? Autonomic. The autonomic nervous system. Okay? And so the autonomic nervous system is important in respiration and, and heart rate and responses to... to uh, stimuli that are like abnormal but also for resting and digesting and they're going to work against one another like so that when you need to your heart rate's going to go up really high but then afterwards it's going to come back down they're going to work against each other so we talked about the respir the pontine respiration center as autonomic nuclei here we have the cardiac center the vasomotor center right and in this case the medullary respirate respiratory center they're all going to control those autonomic responses okay, that are in, important for function. The medulla also cover, important for coughing, sneezing, vomiting, salivating, and swallowing. Right? Um, some other varied functions. <clears throat> One particular um, symptom of a traumatic brain injury is vomiting. Right, concussion, vomit, that is associated with a medulla, a trauma to the medulla, okay, uncontrolled vomiting. All right, and you have nuclei of cranial nerve 10, uh, 12. The vagus nerve is cranial nerve 10, right, which is part of your medulla uh, respiratory center, okay. And eventually you get down to spinal nerve C1. So down here, okay, that's about where the spinal cord separates. Okay, what do you notice about the spinal cord in that case? The white matter's on the outside and the gray matter's on the inside by that point. Okay, this is spatial showing your cardiac and vasomotor centers <clears throat> and the dorsal, ventral and dorsal respiratory groups, areas of neurons that are important for 
autonomic function of the re of those area of respiratory and um, cardiac centers. Okay, the cerebellum is that in the posterior portion of the brain. Okay, we talked about the arbor vitae. The folds are folia. The arbor vitae is the deep white matter that's present in the cerebellum. The vermis is the interior kind of fold. And we can actually separate the cerebellum into hemispheres as well, left and right. The cerebellum coordinates and fine tunes movements. Okay, so walking, uh, fine motor skills are picking up pencil versus, uh, you know, writing with fine movement with your fingers, right, versus when you were a kid and, and kind of scribbling with a pen like this and just kind of making circles, a lot different than now, right? So, important for correct patterns of muscle movements. It, it does some memory storage from previously learned movements such as riding a bike, you remember that, it associates and coordinates those movements together, right? It maintains your equilibrium and posture, your posture <clears throat> up, right? You have upright posture. In order to do that, you have to have continuous innervation of the back muscles, all right? And it helps, receives those proprioceptive inputs of kind of where your balance is off or, or on. Right? And here's your cere cerebellar pathways. So it integrates all of these movements. Where is the motor contact, cortex? The primary motor, motor cortex is in the frontal lobe, right? And the sensory cortex is in the parietal lobe. We have to take inputs from there, put them together, and integrate all of that signals through the cerebellum and connect those with respiration and movements down the spinal cord, so you can see that integration association that occurs through the cerebellum. Questions on any parts of the brain? <clears throat> yes, no, maybe. Awesome sauce. So we move on to the spinal cord. The spinal cord is the extension of the central nervous system uh, throughout the body, okay? There's four areas of the spinal cord, right, that are important. You have cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacrum, okay? Sacral portions of the spinal cord. The spinal cord, those portions are associated with the same um, regions of the vert vertebral column that we talked about during the uh, skeletal system, okay? We, off of the spinal cord come spinal nerves, right? And each spinal nerve is named off or numbered off of where it originates from or exit the spinal cord. So spinal cord, spinal nerve C1, C2, C3, C5, whatever, right? There are th 39 pairs of, of spinal nerves. Why are they paired? Because they have one that goes left and one that goes right, right? C1, left and right. <coughs> Okay, there is an enlargement of the spinal cord at, in the cervical region and the lumbar region. Why do you think there's an enlargement of the cervical and the lumbar region? What comes off of the spinal cord and goes to everywhere? Nerves. Nerves. So why would you have a cervical enlargement and a lumbar enlargement? <coughs> Those are areas where the nerves go to your arms and your legs. Okay, so you have more inputs and outputs from there. Okay, so you have a cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, enlargement of the cervical and the lumbar, we call lumbosacral enlargement. It's actually in the lumbar region. Right, the, the spinal cord technically ends around the area of L1 right about here okay that's where this is the conus medullaris it's a little cone shaped thing that happens at the end of the spinal cord okay but you have uh, spinal nerves that extend down through the vertebrae 
the lumbar and sacral vertebrae, right, that extend down, okay? That's what we call the lumbar plexus, right? Those are, so they come off, the nerves that stay in the, in the vertebral column and extend down through the L lumbar and sacral vertebrae inside the vertebral column, they are actually called the cauda equina. Cauda means tail, equina means horse. So this area of it, you can see the picture over here, okay? Here's the conus medullaris right there. So ending of the cone and now the nerves actually extend further down, and you're looking at this kind of looks like a horse tail. That's the cauda equina. Okay? The plexuses that we talk about, that you see here, in here, you have a, a cervical plexus, a brachial plexus, a lumbar, and a, and a sacral plexus. Okay? That's where the nerves actually extend out from the spinal cord, but then the nerves mix with one another, okay? So if you actually look, at, let's zoom into the brachial plexus here. C5, 6, 7, 8, right? All of these cervical, uh, these spinal nerves come off, even T1, they come off, but then they kind of branch into one another again. They form a plexus. So it's kind of, they come off separately and then they run into one another and it's kind of like, you know, 84 and 284 run into one another for a little while and then they split back off again. Okay? So that's a plexus. We'll talk about those a little bit uh, later. Okay? So the spinal cord size and shape changes depending upon what area of the spinal cord you're looking on. Obviously a cervical enlargement is gonna be a little bit bigger. A lumbar enlargement is gonna be a little bit bigger, right? What it looks like also changes. You'll note that the, the gray matter changes in shape and structure depending upon where you are. The gray matter is always deep, the white matter is always superficial, all right? And we can talk about different areas of the white matter and the gray matter in a little bit, okay? You'll also notice that you have these things in uh, a posterior median sulcus, an indent on the backside, and an anterior median fissure, an indent on the front portion of the spinal cord, okay? In the middle, what do you have? What is that called? That little hole? That's your central canal, all right? And in the central canal is where you'll find cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, so, so we have the indents. <clears throat> the gray matter can also, we can also talk, give directional terms of the gray matter and, and tell you where things are. So here you have a posterior horn, this area of the gray matter is in the posterior. So horns refer to gray matter in the spinal cord. A posterior horn, one to the back. A lateral, one to each side. And an anterior, one to the front. Okay? That refers to the gray matter. The white matter we can actually talk about in terms of columns or funiculi. Funiculus. Okay? We have one in the back that's a posterior lateral, okay, and an anterior funiculus, okay? So we could have anterior, lateral, and posterior, or dorsal, okay, funicula. What covers the brain, what covers the central nervous system for protection? CSF, what, what connective tissues cover them? The meninges, all right? So the meninges cover the brain and the spinal cord, right? And the same, la the same layers of meninges are present in the spinal cord. You have the dura, the arachnoid, and the pia mater. The pia mater is the one that's deepest. 
okay? The, the cerebral spinal fluid is found in the central canal and in the subarachnoid space, all right? You would not put an anesthetic in, in the subarachnoid space. Where do you put it for childbirth? What do you get? What's it called? An epidural, right? An anesthesiologist comes in and puts uh, anesthetic in the epidural space and it cuts off the nerves uh, from that point lower so that a uh, female doesn't have, feel a, the intense pain of childbirth. Is there a recovery time for that? Like how, like... Yeah, usually whenever the anesthetic gets moved away, like it gets degraded. So it takes on an order of hours. Okay? Off of this, so here you actually see the, the, the formation the composure of the spinal nerves. <coughs> Off the spinal nerve, you have an, a posterior root and an anterior root of the spinal nerve. So it's actually part of it's coming from the backside of the, of the spinal nerve, and the, uh, another portion is coming from the front side. The <coughs> posterior side is, is sensory information. <coughs> okay, so this is an afferent pathway. And off the spinal, off the ventral, we we'll call the, the uh, <coughs> dorsal root, there is a, a ganglia. The ganglia is a collection of cell bodies, right? So you see the little bulge right here? That is a dorsal root ganglia. So it's off the dorsal root of the spinal nerve, collection of cell bodies, because that's a sensory information that comes in, and then you have a, a ventral root or an anterior root that is motor information going out. Right? So all spinal nerves are kind of mixed nerves. They have both sensory and motor information. Okay, so here's your more meninges spinal cord, white matter, gray matter, posterior rootlets that come together, posterior root. This is your dorsal root ganglia, right? This is your anterior root ganglia. Anterior root comes together. Together they form, they fuse and form a spinal nerve. Questions <clears throat> on the structure of a spinal cord, gross anatomy of the spinal cord. We've said this, I uh, already talked about the funiculi, posterior lateral and uh, anterior funiculus. The gray matter, we talked about the lateral horns, but there is a piece of gray matter that extends around the central canal and allows left to talk to right, that piece of gray matter is called the gray commissure, all right? And you can see it in the little piece, oh, the little uh, histology you see here, right? What's it, the butterfly looking structure in red is all gray matter, right? While in white matter you have on the outside and central canal on the inside, all right? And we already talked about posterior lateral, lateral and anterior funiculus, okay? Questions? So we talked about the spinal nerves. I said the posterior root was what? The posterior portion of the spinal nerve is what? Sensory or motor? Sens sensory. You guys kind of are, are kind of awake. Okay, sensory, right? And we can actually break that into also somatic or visceral. What does that mean? Somatic versus visceral. Somatic, you're thinking voluntary, right? Yeah. All right, so think about it. It's from the outside, from your voluntary, your somatic muscles, okay? Somatic senses. What about your visceral parts? Internal. Your, or your internal organs, okay? So that's your, your sensory nuclei, somatic versus visceral, right? That's, then you have your autonomic and somatic motor nuclei. Autonomic is stuff you can't control. Somatic is voluntary, okay? And the motor nuclei are on the anterior portion, all right, and they um, originate from the gray matter of the lateral and anterior horns. Eventually, what do you have, what, what, what do you see within the nerve here? This spinal nerve, what do you have? It's 
That's why it's called a mixed neuron, a mixed nerve. They have both sensory information and motor information. Sensory information that's coming from the visceral and the somatic, as well as motor, somatic, and autonomic motor outputs. All right, so it's a mixed nerve. <clears throat> and that's within a typical spinal nerve. That's different from cranial nerves where some of them will be complete motor, some will be complete sensory, and some will be mixed like this, okay? So you have 31 pairs of spinal nerves, okay? Uh, C1 to CO1, which is like the conus one. Each nerve is formed from the merger of an anterior and a posterior root, okay? Those nerves are named for where they come for they leave the spinal cord, right? C cervical nerves exit uh, the intervertebral foramina. If you recall, when we, when we went over the vertebral column, each vertebrae fits into uh, and connects with the next one above it and, be and below it, and they leave little holes in between. Those little holes are where the spinal nerves exit from the spinal cord. Okay, all right. And then below C8, the nerves exit uh, inferior to the vertebrae of the same number. Lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal spinal nerves have long roots, and they actually leave through the sacral. The sacral nerves are actually originate from about L1, and they extend down through the sacrum and then out through the body. Okay, the, those roots form the horse tail that's there. All right, so... Spinal nerves, off of the spinal nerve, you have then a posterior and an anterior ramus. A ramus is not a root, okay? A ramus actually happens after the two roots come together. So posterior root and anterior root fuse to form a spinal nerve. And then off of that, they immediately branch and they form anterior and posterior rami, okay? Posterior are the smaller branches and they innervate your back muscles, all right? And the skin of the back. But then the anterior ramus is bigger and it innervates, splits into a bunch of other branches and they innervate the rest of the anterior muscles. Think about where your body is, where the spinal cord is in your body. The posterior branches don't have to be very, far, very big, right? They're going to stay back there and only have a little bit of tissue to go through that are more posterior than where the spinal cord is. So it doesn't have to go very far. The anterior branch has to go and extend out and forward in everything that is anterior of the spinal cord, all right? And then you have rami committing cans, which are small autonomic fibers. All right, so this is what it looks like, okay? Off of this, here's your root. Here's the root, right? Dorsal root, posterior root come together. And now from here, it immediately branches. This small thing is this posterior ramus. These are the, the muscles of your, your um, back. And then into the skin, right? Not very far to go from where it is. But the anterior ramus ha is much bigger and extends all the way out. We eventually would come all the way out here and around to where the rest of the rib cage and all the anterior portions of the body are. Okay? So the ramus is, rami are just branches of spinal nerves. <laughs> Dermatomes are what we just areas of the skin that are, are innervated by different spinal nerves. Okay? So if you think about where your top to superior to inferior, as you move down from this area of the skin of the body, different areas are innervated by different spinal nerves as you move superior to inferior. Okay? But this is involved in refer, referred visceral pain. 
Okay? So sometimes, for instance, where is the appendicitis? Lower right quadrant, right? The appendix is in the lower right quadrant of the abdomen. But sometimes when you have, uh, because the spinal nerve that innervates that same area, you may actually have referred back pain to the thoracic, the same nerve goes in there and you might actually have some referred back pain to somewhere which may actually may indicate kidney problems or something like that. So these are what the dermatomes look like. So, <clears throat> so T10, right, lower right quadrant, L1 is where the, append the appendicitis would be, but you actually have some referred pain to T10. All right, so that kind of gives you an idea about what those nerves look like and where their skin functions are going to cover. So off of, so we talked about roots, ramuses, and now we're going to talk about plexuses. Oh, good gosh. Plexuses are now those anterior ramus of each spinal nerve go out and then they can start to kind of weave into one another, <coughs> all right? So it's an anterior rami that are weaving into one another and mixing together, okay? And there are four major plexuses that you are responsible for. Brachial, lumbar, cervical, and sacral. All right, so individual, brand, individual, individual ramuses. So from ramus from C1 to sacral 1, right? From the first spinal, <laughs> spinal nerve 1 to spinal nerve 31. Each anterior ramus can break off and branch repeatedly, right? Think about a main, uh, the main trunk of a tree. It goes up and it can kind of have break into smaller parts, right? But imagine then if that tree, that branch that, that comes off of the main trunk fuses with another branch that come off one of the other trunks. That's what's happening with these plexuses, okay? They're kind of running into one another and they're forming uh, the works. Okay? Uh, Intracostals don't care. All right, so here's important plexuses. So you can see C cervical nerve C1 through C8, right? You can actually see here that the plexuses, so here's one, two, three, four, five, right? Six. They all start to run together those anterior rami come together and form this plexus, right? So you have a cervical plexus, and then down here you have a brachial plexus. Further down, there's a lumbar plexus and then a sacral plexus. So there's, these branches are just coming together. All right, so that's d dorsal and ventral rami, and then plexuses. This is kind of another picture of what you're looking at. Ventral or anterior. Here's your posterior ramus, short. The ventral ramus, much longer. And then those actually br branch together and form plexuses, right? So a plexus is defined as a network of nerves serving motor and sensory needs of the limbs, cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral. You are responsible for knowing the important nerves that are associated with each of these plexuses, all right? So for the cervical plexus, you have what's called the phrenic nerve, okay? The phrenic nerve innervates the diaphragm, the shoulder, and the neck, okay? The phrenic nerve, the diaphragm. So this, so what we talked about, the fact that the medulla and the pons control breathing. So what does the phrenic nerve do? When you want to stand here, right, everybody, take a really deep breath in. Really deep breath out. You just use your phrenic nerve, okay? 
your, nor, your autonomic nor, nu, nuclei that, co, that control respiration, they control your normal rhythmic, what we call tidal volume, up and down normal breathing, right? They will also control your increase in respiration rate when you're exercising or you're excited or something like that. And it will control and slow it down when you stop exercising, okay? But the part of this where you voluntarily inhale or exhale and you voluntarily, you, you purposely force more air out and, or bring more air in, that is a, a voluntary uh, stimulus that goes down the phrenic nerve to the diaphragm because the diaphragm is a skeletal muscle, all right? And here is part of your cervical plexus. A couple of the cranial nerves actually uh, extend into this, all right? And you, you don't have to know all of the different nerves that are associated with it, right? But you should, the one you are responsible for is this one, okay? The brachial plexus, there's a couple important nerves, right? Axillary, radial, median, muscul musculocutaneous, and the ulna. Where do they go? Brachial, where do they go? The arm. Axillary is what nerve? Where do you think it's going to be? Armpit, right? Radial, where does it go? Radius. Median goes down the middle. Where does the ulna go? The ulna nerve, what, is, what happens? That's your, your funny bone, okay? When you hit that, your elbow on something, and you feel that tingling goes right down the, your pinky and your ring finger, right? And you're like, oh, I hit my funny bone. You didn't hit the bone, you hit the ulnar nerve, okay? So it goes in all of the upper appendage. Now right? you can see it here, all right? Different trunks of it, I don't really care. This picture's better, all right? So here's the humerus. Right there's the ulna, and you can actually see right here is your ulnar nerve, and you hit that right when you hit the elbow, okay? So. The lumbar plexus originates from the uh, L1 through L4, your femoral nerve and your obturator <laughs> nerves. Where do you think the obturator nerve goes through? obturator foramen in your, in your hip, on your coxal bones, right? And the femoral nerve goes down the, the front of your leg. All right, this actually serves the lower abdomen, and the anterior and medial thigh, okay? Anterior and medial thigh, not the back, all right? So if someone says, oh, I have sciatic pain in my leg, in my front leg, no, they don't. That goes down the back leg, right, the, through the butt down the back of the leg. <clears throat> okay, the femoral, the obturator is lower abdomen and the anterior medial thigh. And here you can see it, right, here's the femoral <coughs> and the obturator runs right through the obturator foramen and down the medial portion of the thigh. The sacral plexus, right, more important, most of the time you will see this one. This is a large one. Someone says, I have sciatica or I have sciatic nerve, right? The sciatic nerve is the largest nerve in the body. It controls, uh, it innervates the lower trunk, the posterior thigh, the lateral posterior leg and foot, all right, and the gluteal muscles, okay? So all of the posterior portions of the leg are, is the sciatic, and I don't want to do that, all right? And you can see here the posterior portion. You can actually see this highlighted in black is your sciatic nerve, right? Right down through the back of the leg, okay? But the plexuses come together off of the spinal nerves, right? The, all of those kind of run together and they form these nerve plexuses which then give rise to the different nerves we've talked about. Okay, questions up to there. All right, we're gonna stop today. We'll 